All righty, guys. This one is going to be a bit of a doozy. I'm going to be talking for a while. I'm going to be talking specifically about potentially, possibly, my favorite RPG of all time. Hunter the Reckoning. My general thoughts on it as a whole. Uh, specifically, my setting, my take on both of the World of Darkness and specifically the city Philly by night. And my how I would like run a session, how I would run a campaign or story and chronicle. Uh, okay, but yeah, without further ado, here's just like a quick little intro if you are unfamiliar with what Hunter the Reckoning is. It is a world of darkness. Unbeknownst to nearly all of humanity, supernatural forces vie for control in a conflict hidden beyond the vision of ordinary people. Vampires and werewolves see humans as pawns in their endless struggle for world domination. All of this is concealed behind an elaborate masquerade. Vampire feedings are disguised as gang violence. Werewolf attacks are explained as animal maulings. But now, a mysterious force has imbued a chosen few humans with not just the knowledge of the existence of such evil, but with the power to do something about it. The hunted have become the hunters. Okay, uh, but basically, yeah, you, you guys are mostly ordinary people with the ability to, you got very tiny, slight superpowers. You got the ability to, like, see uh, vampires and werewolves, and you can, like, generally, uh, like, not be affected by their mind control nonsense. And you, you get, like, some tiny little, what I guess is supposed to mostly be within the realms of possible sort of powers. Um, like, there's that example of, like, a woman being able to, like, lift a car uh, when, when her child is trapped underneath. So, and you can, like, tap into that, like, power to throw a paperclip through a vampire's heart or... Yeah, that, that, that's one of the examples. But yeah, you, you, you get tiny little powers. Um, okay, so I'm, what I'm talking about, Hunter the Reckoning here, I'm not talking about the new V5. I'm also not talking about Hunter the Vigil. We're, we're talking about the 1990-whatever Hunter the Reckoning game with that awesome cover of just pure flames. There's just not room for anything else than just fire and destruction. Uh, that is a sick cover, and every other Hunter book they've written since then has had lame covers. Uh, okay, so why am I choosing Hunter the Reckoning over Hunter the Vigil? So Hunter the Vigil, I actually, I do quite like. I like a lot of the ideas of Hunter the Vigil. Uh, and in fact, like, as both a game and as a RPG book, it is, like, way better laid out and, like, figured out as, like, uh, you know, just mechanically and all of that. But the one major difference is the one that I've got a problem with, and that is the fact that they've gotten rid of the imbued, which the imbued is this idea that you've been touched by a mysterious alien angel and given the power to be able to see the monsters. And Hunter the Vigil, they've just... Uh, they're, they're just regular Joe Schmoes that have somehow found out about the existence of vampires and are now taking it upon themselves to go forth and hunt them down. My, my kind of sort of problem with this is that I feel like... Okay, I'll say, on the one hand, I can totally understand why people would prefer Hunter the Vigil. I definitely see the argument. I can see why, like, come on, if we're playing a game where we're playing humans in the world of darkness, like... I want to just be a human in the world of darkness. I don't, I don't want all these angel superpowers. I, I just want to be a regular guy. Uh, yeah, I, I can see why that's what people want out of Hunter the Reckoning. But I do think this idea of everyone just having the capability of becoming a hunter kind of does some real damage to the internal consistent logic of the world. Right, because now anyone can just see stuff happening and then decide to take it upon themselves to, to go out and forth and do their thing. Which means that, like, basically people can just 
convince each other, right, that, like, this stuff is going on. Whereas in Hunter the Reckoning, you've, you know, they just, at the very beginning, there's some magical hand waviness going on. Like, you guys are special for whatever reason. You guys have the ability to see the monsters, right? And you know, if you try to convince other people, they just, they are not able to see them. So it's just, it's like pretty much futile. Like, you know, you're not going to be able to rely on like your friends or coworkers or whatever, or like maybe, maybe if you're very fortunate or talented in the art of rhetoric or whatever, or you just have enough evidence, like you could possibly convince like a, a bystander or something, but like, without your ability to have the vision, right? Other people are really going to struggle to try to convince, like, future. Like, your bystander isn't really going to be able to just convince his friends or whatever. Whereas, like, in Hunter the Vigil, there's no potential stop to that chain of just, like, anyone could conceivably convince anyone else that this stuff is happening in real. Um, at which point, like, the whole masquerade in general seems like a pretty flimsy sort of device to rely on as to why people don't know. And I think just adding even more reasons and evidence as to how that whole system could be breaking down is, you know, a little bit of a, a slippery slope towards, like, having any trust in the verisimilitude of this whole, like, setting at all. Okay, so so some arguments I've heard for, like, Hunter the Vigil as to, like, how would everyone not just know at this point that stuff is going on? And, like, one argument I hear is, like, oh, well, what about UFO videos, right? People spread those around, and there's a whole underground community of people who, like, believe in that stuff, right? Even though, like, and, and they have evidence, but, like, it's still not a mainstream thought, and that's what, like, Hunter stuff would be like. Except I feel like this kind of does the opposite of prove that point, because the problem is that, like, UFOs aren't real, right? So, like, if you are able to convince people that aliens have visited Earth because you take a picture and there's, like, three glowing dots around it or whatever, right? Like, if you just get a camcorder or whatever and you record your neighbor Bob getting ripped in half by like a werewolf or something like i feel like that that's going to uh you know if all it takes is like three orbs to convince like millions of people that like aliens have been to earth and have visited then i feel like video footage of like werewolves tearing people in half are going to that that's going to like probably be way more effective at convincing people and i i like the like the hunter of the reckoning where like there is just a like cloud of like delirium that prevents any ordinary person from ever like seeing any of this supernatural stuff and you need to be one of those in on it slight supernatural people in order to have like any chance of like figuring out what's going on so so some other things that like uh like potentially are you know that you have to know for like just drama's sake as like a difference between the reckoning and the vigil then the reckoning you'll never really be able to do one of those like bum 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 your uncle was a vampire the whole time since you can just see vampires whereas in the vigil you can still do any sort of stuff like that you you can have supernaturals like coming in and out of people's lives without them ever even knowing uh now i guess in hunter the reckoning where you kind of can include stuff like that is that you never really know who's working for who and then you know your uncle might be in the pocket of like some vampire or something so you can still play with ideas like that so i don't really think that's necessarily a whole like element that is lost from uh you know from the reckoning to the vigil uh okay another thing that i really just do not like at all about the vigil is the whole task force valkyrie there's an entire branch of like the government or the military or whatever that is designed to hunt down monsters and stuff 
uh, that like whole element of that thing going on i just do not like at all i i i like much prefer the like the camaria and or whatever other supernaturals have just 100 percent infiltrated like every single government and um you know they, they, they are just using that as even more like power to control like the masquerade from inside and uh, another thing that i kind of dislike about the whole you know ma making people into task force delta green or whatever is like this idea of that it, it feels like the change comes from like the top down and this very like well there's this giant conspiracy of like thousands of workers or whatever who are all working together and you guys are just tiny little gears in that machine who are being sent off to go and do this mission for this giant organization. Whereas I much prefer the classic Hunter the Reckoning, like, you guys are just some random guys in your community, and you guys are just going to uh, just, just fight these monsters in your neighborhood, and that all that change is coming from the bottom up. Uh, and that like you know the the fact that you guys are doing this and every other city and community and neighborhood also has their own group of hunters they're like that's how you guys are making a difference is by uh like like being a part of this like grassroots movement so yeah but overall i do actually quite quite like hunter the vigil i just like hunter the reckoning is just the king of games so they, they had a really tough fight to you know beat that Okay, so here are some cool parts. Some things that I really, really love about Hunter the Reckoning as a RPG. Like, what makes it one of my favorites? The interpersonal drama is just built into the premise, right? The whole game is this, like, balance between being a hunter and having your humanity. Like, what you're, you're doing all this fighting for right it's just like uh just the fact that this imbuing thing has happened to you just instantly like as a natural conclusion to that there is going to be problems between th that hunting lifestyle and some combination of your job your family your friends like the things that you care about right and there's this constant unavoidable balance of like the more you defend humanity, the more you fight these monsters and defend the things that you care about, the more you lose those things that you care about. That's all that time that you are not spending with those various things. Just like another little mini part of that like conflict where just like on the more logistics side, right? Like hunting is just really, really expensive. You know, you got to buy like bulletproof vests and like shotguns and you know armor up your van or whatever like there, there's just a lot of money you got to invest into being a really good hunter uh and if you like lose your job then you're gonna start having a really hard time continuing being a hunter uh okay so another part that i love is that the inter-party drama is built into the class or in this game they are called creeds but they are in essence your class um it is built into that system right so you might have characters who are all about trying to redeem monsters they want to save the lives save the humanity of monsters they want to find monsters who have not totally given in and like can be brought back um, and then you have the complete opposite of those who are like people who are uh, like just trying to kill every single monster no matter what because they always pose a potential threat to the safety of the humans in the community. Um, you've also got people who are primarily like focused on just saving those innocents who are near them and really aren't particularly concerned about whether or not the monster lives or dies just as long as the people who are who would be hurt are safe and okay and a lot of these a lot of the times these are very like conflicting uh 
priorities, right? You, you normally, you aren't always going to be able to do all of these things. You're not going to be able to save everyone and save the monster and stop the monster from ever being a threat again. Uh, yeah, yeah. So your, your players, they're just going to have to make hard choices as like the compromises they're going to have to make as being a part of this group. And like, like, and in Hunter the Reckoning, right? You, you, you're not choosing your allies. You're not going to be able to just pick working with this group and join their big old group of hunters where you all have the same idea right there are only so many people in your community that are imbued right so you you really have like two choices you either work with these other people who are imbued or you can just hunt alone and hunting alone is really not a choice because everything is so incredibly more powerful than you, you will die. You have to use teamwork in order to be able to beat a vampire. Yeah, you're, you're gonna have to work with these other imbued hunters just purely out of necessity, and you guys are just going to have to work through your differences. All right, so another thing that's nice about like Hunter the Reckoning as opposed to, say, D&D. Uh, people, since, since it mostly just takes place in real life, you can use all the context that you know of real life. Like in D&D, you don't really know anything about politics, culture, usually not anything about history. Whereas, you know, as, in, like, as just in real life, you, you can constantly just reference any of those things and make all your dialogue sound more real and natural and have various things have more uh you know just just everything has more context so it's just easier for people to connect to and relate to their real life as like players who are role playing through these characters uh okay again so combat it relies on creativity and teamwork if you guys just walk up to a vampire on the street and try to shoot him with a shotgun there is a good chance that he will just tank that hit and then stick his hand through your chest and rip your heart out of your rib cage. You guys are going to have to be creative. You guys are going to have to wait and track the vampire until he goes home without him knowing that you're there and then set his house on fire while he's asleep. Like you're 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 going to have to try to set up traps. You just cannot get away with straight up one on one fights like you would in like you know a party of d and d adventurers fighting goblins or something that is just not going to work in this game uh and another thing I like the fact that this gives you a chance to show off and use everything you know from the world of darkness. You can use all the meta plot lore from all the millions of splats that you know and just create this massive like fan fiction web of random like ideas that you like from all the different lines of books and just you get to combine them however you want. Which I should say right now that like Hunter the Reckoning, I think for new players i think the game is great because like you're mostly just a human so there's not a very there's not a whole lot that you have to like move your brain overwhelm from to be like a like sympathetic in the mind of your character but for dms i think like this is definitely one of those games that you are going to want to have some experience under your belt before you try to tackle like if you're a new dm i think i would definitely recommend like just running D, D or something before you just jump right into hunter the reckoning okay so another thing that i want to talk about with hunter some potential uh, problems and by problems i don't mean actual problems i mean things topics uh sensitive subjects that if handled poorly could become problems all right, so there's lots of, a lot of the sort of edgy subject matter that makes Hunter the Reckoning such a cool, real game 
it's only cool because it is kind of dangerous and it is kind of riding that border between what's like acceptable and what's not which again i do think that it makes the whole game worth playing um like, like it, it's the reason why you play hunter the reckoning but it's important to like understand these aspects um so that you like aren't just sort of like trivializing some of the different uh like things that will come up over the course of the game which is basically to say like with these following things i would not take the spontaneous approach of the like move fast and break things idea that like I would otherwise normally just default to when it comes to like uh, like improv and spontaneity in a game. I would definitely make sure you, you put a little bit of thought into these subject matters and put some intentionality behind them so that when they do come up over the course of the game, you're kind of like ready to tackle them. Um, and, and another thing is that like, Hunter the Reckoning, the whole world, not a particularly serious world. There is some absurd levels of goofiness with, you know, because it, it's all a game about hunting vampires, right? Uh, you know, there, there's Santa Claus running around, if you want Santa Claus to be a mage. Um, but, you know, you're, yeah, you're, you're running around killing wizards and whatever. Like, there's lots and lots of silliness. Um, so I would just say, like, that's another potential uh obstacle is like you, you don't accidentally want to get those wires crossed of the like what is fine with making silly and what are some things that you probably should not make silly um okay so first things first the absolute most intense thing that's going on is the whole idea of vampires which vampires are going to be coming up a lot they're, they're like one of the core enemies for hunters. And the thing that vampires need to do to survive is the kiss, it is called. But it is literally vampires take people and they bring them into alleyways. They lure them in there and, and then they like jump on them and then suck their blood out of their neck, right? So I, I don't think the comparison is that far off from that being like straight up like sexual assault and that's gonna be happening it's gonna like come up over the course of the game right uh because vampires are there and like even in situations like combat they they literally do this to like heal themselves um so so it's like a pretty undeniable thing that's gonna happen and again i'm not not even to say that you need to like avoid this or anything like like uh, just just be ready for it when it shows up yeah uh, be sh make sure that uh, like everyone is aware that this is like a kind of thing this is a kind of subject that is going to be broached over the course of the game another just like main core thing of like hunter the reckoning as a game like there's going to be lots of like heavy themes of alienation from your family which you know that's a thing that happens in real life and in this specifically that from that angle of like mental illness because you're you're basically going crazy or it, it's pretty much no different than going crazy according to the rest of human society and like that is a thing that is happening to people in real life uh, especially like in this game it's you guys are basically members of like space QAnon or not space magic QAnon but you know that's a thing happening to to real people and real families and stuff so again make sure people know that that's like a thing that's gonna come up in the game so okay th this one is kind of related to the entirety of the world of darkness like the entire conceit of the world of darkness of that there are evil vampires behind everything kind of just undermines the idea of all of like real evil in the world of like these systems of power that have you know years and millennia of like history behind them and the like 
the people, the like psychopaths or the narcissists or the the greedy people who defend those systems and propagate them and like you know the bystanders that like don't do anything about the systems and like that whole idea of how real life evil actually comes to be and exist uh, is kind of like just swept under the rug when there's now an answer of like well it's the vampires who did it because they wanted to have an atrocity to disguise their feedings which is not to say that you can't do that right like go ahead and write your fiction where the vampires are the reason for that thing. Just make sure you're doing that, like, with some level of intentionality. Like, I think the the easiest rule of thumb regarding this is if the whole, like, usage of the atrocity in this, if it is to highlight the the victims and the real evil behind the act or the situation then you're probably fine or in at least in the right headspace whereas if you are using the atrocity to highlight just how evil your made-up vampires are then you're probably doing it wrong um and then you know white wolf there's tons and tons of examples of them doing this poorly and them doing this in a way that's fine right there was the whole gay chechnyan genocide thing going on that people got very salty about and then there's examples of like the camaria using immigrant detention centers which like people generally uh responded to finely um so again like i think it, it, it's fine to to write your stories with this just you know make make sure you're doing it for a reason or make sure you're doing it for a a, a good reason <laughs> okay next thing so there's just a little problem that comes up with all of like syncretic fiction which uh specifically comes up with van in like this world of darkness quite a bit and that is this idea of so soaking with syncretic fiction is this idea of like when you combine a bunch of different religions, right? When you say that like Buddhism is real and Christianity is real and all these various different things are real, right? There's kind of like this idea to then, or just based off of your biases as like, you know, a Western Eurocentric born person or whatever, right? You're, you're biased towards making the default all these various like, judeo-christian ideas and like uh systems of the celestial and the divine that fit within those parameters and then every other religion kind of you have to twist and shape and form in order to make them like fit inside those ideas which uh or like on the other hand if you make if you just straight up say christianity is legit and the right one and here is like spiritual evidence that that is the case then you then imply that like they might have actually been justified in everything that they've done because every other religion is now objectively like a fraud so i would well, okay, my, my first thought would be, like, I would generally just try to make sure there is some plausible deniability whenever topics like this come up. Because, like, again, there's ghosts, so there is an afterlife, and there are demons. There are, like, fallen angels, so there's some sort of heaven that they must have fallen from. Uh, or, on the other hand, right, like, if you do just decide to make Christianity the right one, You can do that too. Just make sure that you are doing it with intention and you are addressing how that this, the, those implications on what this says about every other faith and everything. Okay. So again, I I just wanted to, uh, you know, you you can never be too careful. So now I'm going to talk about my take on how Hunter interacts specifically with the setting of the city of Philadelphia. So I generally quite like the various 
like compacts that they created in Hunter the Vigil and the sort of like ideas behind them. And so how I have this sort of laid out is these are each compacts that each have a representative in the city of Philadelphia. So you can potentially interact with that organization through these people. Okay, so first ones first. The Maiden's Blood Sisterhood. They are a like pan-Hellenic council of sorority members. They've got, you know, representatives in various sororities all across the country or potentially even the world, actually. So their main primary focus is to protect youths. They want to protect kids or youngins, you know, college students, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, they ideally want to redeem monsters. They, they are believers. The Maiden's Blood Sisterhood, of all these various compacts that are going to come up, the Maiden's Blood Sisterhood are probably the most objectively good ones, like doing everything they are out of just pure morality and ethics and stuff. That having been said, that's kind of their like internal conflict as a group, or their conflict as compared to all the other compacts, is that they are just ineffective. Like they just, they are not doing a whole lot to stop the whole spread of vampirism and, you know, stopping werewolf attacks because they are more concerned with spending like you know a number of months just to try to make a single vampire into a like good person who can like like see the value of humanity and not to not give into the beast whereas if they were just okay with killing people they might have been able to just kill you know like a, a vampire a week or something um, so, so the other compacts don't really like them because they just don't really get anything done. But otherwise, well, there, I guess what I would say is their internal conflict is that when youths are in trouble, when like children are at risk, then they will just consider the monster irredeemable and just be okay with killing them at that point. So the leader, or not the leader, the representative here is... Melissa Reed. She is a Penn State sorority president. Now her little gimmick is that she is actually not a hunter. She is not imbued. She is in fact a mage of the path of the Arcanthus. And she has just mistook her awakening as an imbuing, right? She has had this experience, you know, she mistook a bump of or she mistook what ended up being like 500 doses of LSD as a bump of coke, had a transcendental spiritual experience where their avatar, you know, talked to them or whatever, and they went on their little vision quest, and then they awoke. And then, right, when they went to try to find other people that have had these similar experiences, instead of finding other mages, they found other hunters. Uh, so again, some potential room for drama and conflict there when the other compacts discover that she's not actually a hunter. She is, in fact, a mage. Okay, but, but again, she, she's one of the good ones, you know, not one of them wizards, uh, you know, killing, sacrificing people for, to fuel their magic or whatever. Okay, and then I have a couple of, like, little side quests or little, like, side hooks that could be potentially attached to these specific groups if like the players either want to do something for them or if these people have like a favor that they need the players to do so the first one i love this idea of this quest of sesame place having a problem with the unseely or potentially goblins um just because there is so much pure child like imagination and just carefree, like, playfulness and energy, um, all concentrated in this one place that is just like a, an ideal feeding ground for changelings, where they can just have 
just pure imagination and creativity fueling them. And, and, and that, yeah, the, these evil fae, if you will, have taken over it. I love the idea of the players having to go in. I imagine if I were to ever do the Far Cry uh, drug level or whatever, this is where I would throw that in. The players, like, now normally, you know, hunters are like, can become immune to, like, illusions, but, like, fey magic, they, they are just, like, coming in and out of this world of substance and the world of shadow, and that they are, like, phasing between these two. And so the hunters need more than just their second sight to be able to see them. They need to take, like, these hallucinogenic psychedelics that actually open up their mind to being able to uh like keep track of where these fey are going in and out of i also i just i love the idea of like goblins and or chimeras as like these hideous monster versions of like big bird and the various other muppets and stuff that like they've generated these constructs out of off of the like imagination of like the children um that otherwise are here and i also i think this would just be a very you know if the players are ever like losing hope in their whole situation i think this could be a pure like indomitable human spirit humanity fuck yeah kind of moment where the fey are just like dunking on them and just like you know using all their tricks or whatever and it just feels like the hunters have no chance but then at some point something changes that the like there's some climax where the hunters realize like wait the power is actually in us the whole time we just you know you have to have your anime shonen moment where you just have to believe and because they're fey and they their energy just feeds off of the imagination of the people near them once you guys start to just believe in yourselves the fey start to believe in you too and then it actually just starts to work it just begins to manifest and then you actually do just start to beat the fey because you guys believe in yourselves that much that they now believe in you too so i just think that would be an amazing little side quest to run okay the other quest the classic they purport to have a cure for vampirism and they invite vampires to come to them to be cured. Maybe there's a quest where you guys have to retrieve the ingredients for this. And then, of course, there's no real cure for vampirism. So it, it just is some holy water or something or other that, that does end up just killing the vampire. But at the very least, their final death. I guess you could leave this up to interpretation. But I like the idea that it uh, it doesn't cause, like, final death. It does not, like, destroy their spirit or send them to hell for eternity. But instead that this is their only way out of vampirism and that they do die, but they regain their humanity as they die and die just as a, uh, a regular human who gets to go to the very fun, undepressing wraith, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, afterlife or whatever. Okay, so that was the first compact. Compact number two. Okay, so the Night Watch. These guys are vigilantes. They are like militia. They're kind of like Proud Boy E, Boogaloo Boy E. Um, they just like straight up patrol the streets. They are the complete opposite of the Maiden's Blood Sisterhood in the sense that these guys are very much so get stuff done kinds of hunters. They do not care about, like, collateral damage. And if they're going to have to, like, burn down a mall, like, filled with people uh, to kill, like, a coven of vampires, like, hiding in the basements, like, they will take that risk. Like, they're, they're not going to feel good about it, but, like, they, they will do that if they need to. And they, they generally, they have connections with, like, the criminal undergrounds and gangs and stuff. And they're... Like, one of the more positive sides of them, well, mixed, I guess, is more accurate to say, is that they are one of the few compacts that is actually willingly, uh, that will willingly, like, go into and protect, like, poor areas and poor neighborhoods and, like, 
protect the like the most vulnerable areas that actively have the most like supernatural activity mostly because the other like compacts just like refuse to actually go in there uh, but yeah so the night watch they actually they get it done okay their representative is archie harris who is a delaware river stevedores union member uh he's a dock worker it very very much so the wire season two kind of vibe so on a personal level his little struggle is that like he himself is an immigrant but he is he he really dislikes it is some like strike has happened and other immigrants are now scabbing and he really does not like that and he's kind of become one of these like pull the ladder up types but otherwise his little like side quests uh there's a shipment coming in i guess this could necessarily this could either be a quest that he needs help on because he wants to build a giant bomb to kill a bunch of vampires or something like to attack a coven or something um, or that he could potentially be able to acquire resources and it doesn't necessarily i, I like the idea of getting a sh shipment of fertilizer to make into ammonium nitrate um but conceivably he could otherwise just do this like as a favor for like the pcs uh to get like resources or guns or whatever it is that they need by like smuggling them off of like shipments okay another quest that i have that i kind of like uh just to show off that these guys are no nonsense get it done kinds of guys they invite the pcs to just do a full-on straight up siege against like a vampire nightclub like just crash in through the wall wear bulletproof vests um have shotguns with that dragon breath shell the the flamethrowers all that incendiary ammunition and just like shock and awe just like just crash through and just start killing vampires uh again you know they, they'd probably burn down the entire building if not like the entire block so if there's like innocence, either like being blood dolls or like uh, humans that are like sympathetic to vampires or if they are just completely random humans that are just dancing in a nightclub, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of innocent losses if, if, the hum if the PCs follow along with the plan. So the other alternative is maybe this is a thing that's happening that the PCs want to stop Archie Harris from doing because they know how much damage it'll cause to the innocents of the community if he does it. Okay, the next one. The Society of Leopold. Now, this one's not necessarily a compact. This is actually, like, a huge, like, organization. But it's specifically the whole, like, continuation of the Inquisition sort of deal. That, like, to some extent, like, the Inquisition existed to hunt down supernaturals. So, these guys... They're basically just the hyper zealot, super religious Christian guys. So they believe that the messengers are undeniably angels from I am that I am, you know, the God, uh, capital G God. Okay. They believe Perusia, the second coming of Christ, it is imminent. It is going to happen. They need to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. They believe all supernaturals are minions of the antichrist they do not do working with vampires out of convenience kind of thing and that's kind of their difference from the night watch whereas like the night watch right if they could get like a vampire informant that could lead to them killing like 10 more vampires sure they they will like they will do that which again sometimes that leads to them getting abused sometimes they end up accidentally doing the dirty work of the sabbat for them and end up doing more damage to everything the society of leopold they just don't mess with any of that stuff they don't believe in good supernaturals which again potential conflict if like how aware they become with uh melissa of the maiden's blood sisterhood okay um yeah they're, they're their main thing is really they are judges they really judge the uh and, and i guess in this circumstance they really judge everything worthy of of death which i guess the classic judge is uh whether or not they are good or bad or whatever 
Um, you know what? Maybe it would make more sense for the Night Watch to actually be the judges in this society to just be the Avengers. Okay. Um, so their representative in Philadelphia is Reverend Callahan. He is like violently Irish, super Roman Catholic. He is specifically a member of the sect of the children of Lazarus, who are specifically like the anti-undead crusaders. And now the society, so they're kind of, now, okay, so so they're kind of like internal conflict, right? Is that obviously they they want to just like kill everyone and everything, but... Well, not everyone, everything. They, they want to kill all supernatural everything. But they accept that in order to prepare for the second coming of Christ, uh, they need to, they want to realign all the compacts of Philadelphia. They want all the hunters working together, and they are actively willing to make compromises to make that happen. Or at least this is like a new recent development with them. So I, I would recommend this as like if the players are going to run into one of these compacts first, I would probably start with like the Society of Leopold so that they can kind of get this main sort of campaign spanning quest of trying to align all the various groups of uh, of Philadelphia, of the Hunters in Philly. Okay, and so just like the the last time that this happened, one of the previous great maelstroms in the world meta plot, um, the last time all the hunters worked together in Philadelphia was in the 40s, the slaughter of Fairmount. They worked together and they cleared out all of the werewolves in Fairmount Park. And unfortunately, this had the consequence of like werewolves being among sort of the cooler of the various types of supernatural, at least when it comes to being cool with humanity. Um, and them slaughtering a whole bunch of werewolves has actually just created a whole vacuum, allowing a ton of other supernaturals who are, like, way more evil than werewolves, like vampires, to, like, take over and, like, move into the city. Okay. Liberty Anonymous. So these guys are basically the full-on Alex Jones, like, QAnon guys. Their job is just to collect as much data and, more importantly, spread it. They are, uh, they are just trying to give as much information as they possibly have on all the various supernaturals to as many people as possible. Okay, their representative is Orville Spuckler. Kind of like a rednecky type of guy uh, who owns his muffler shop, Spuckler's Mufflers. He is in a wheelchair. Uh, he is like very big on the hunter net, right? He will like help the players navigate the hunter net and uh, like help them get information on it, help them post information on it, any and all of that stuff. Otherwise, yeah, he, he like ideally likes the idea of trying to convince the world but he doesn't really know he, he doesn't really have the resources or the means to do that but yeah he, he's they're kind of also like the stand-in for like the vigil network zero type and their belief in the messengers is that this is all like military psychotronic research uh like project bluebird or whatever the continuation of like MK Ultra, all part of that sort of thing going on, where he believes that all these super not all the supernaturals, the werewolves and vampires, are like communist created experiments that have been like unleashed in America to destroy it from the inside out, and that America's defense has been to use combinations of like putting stuff in the water and like using satellites to beam into direct uh like chosen citizens heads of the existence of these like various monsters or whatever because they don't want to freak out all of he all of america by telling everyone this and so his sort of take on this is that like he's kind of upset he does not like the u.s government he does not like that he is getting their citizens to do their dirty work he he is not a fan 
But on the other hand, he does accept that whether he likes it or not, right, he has got the, there. there's vampires running around in his community killing people, and he's been given the, the chance, the duty, the obligation to do something about it, so... He's just feels like he's he's got to. He just doesn't feel like he has a choice to like whether or not he wants to work with the government. Like he has to stop these monsters. Okay. The uh, and also he can just sort of like he's sort of like the gadget guy. If like players need you know shotguns glued together or whatever glued to a RC car or something. Okay. The Ashwood Abbey. Uh, these guys are probably the closest thing to just straight up bad guys as a hunter organization. They are just full on sybarites, full on libertines. They strictly just hunt for sport. They are just doing this whole thing for the thrill of it. They they just are doing it because it's fun. They're doing it for the fun of it. They really just do not care about humanity at all. Um, okay, so here's their representatives. Reginald and Cornelius, who I envision both as very, very violently English, uh, like safari, pith helmet wearing types, uh, you know, smoking pipes and mutton chops and the, the whole nine. Okay, so they exist in the secret wing of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They are just ludicrously wealthy. They have access to basically any resources that anyone could want. They hunt for competition. They want to show off to all the other Ashwood Abbey members. They want to have the coolest and biggest werewolf head ever. Um, they hunt for legacy. They want to, when they grow up, they want their uh, their arist aristocratic, like, you know, royal family or whatever. They, they want their sons and daughters to grow up and hopefully become hunters too. And then they will, like, be able to, you know, have all this honor from all the great kills that they have achieved. And they are otherwise just straight up trophy collectors. They just want to be able to mount the heads of monsters on the walls. So yeah, they, they just, they're mostly just dicks. They are mostly going to be hunter antagonists for you. Like, they kind of just exist to get in the way like, occasionally, the players, the party, will come up with their own... They will find, like, good monsters. They will find monsters who are at least useful, helpful monsters. Monsters that are either informants or what have you. Like, monsters that are willing to fight against other supernaturals, all of that type. The Ashwood Abbey will just, like, come in and kill those when it's inconvenient for the party. Uh, and occasionally, they are just, like, a necessity to work with. Sometimes... You just, you have a plan for a monster that it's going to cost like $4 million to enact this plan. And the only people that have access to any kinds of resources like that are going to be the Ashwood Abbey. Um, yeah, so if you have to like buy a helicopter or something for your plan, you like, you might just have to work with the Ashwood Abbey. Uh, they are just going to be annoying the whole time. Okay, Null Mystery Ease. So these guys are some of the, like, they're probably the second most kind of evilish. They They are kind of the, or like kind of secondary antagonist hunters in the sense that they are kind of like the ends justify the means types of, uh, like they are willing to work with, whoever and they are willing to like do whatever okay okay well I'll, I'll, I'll get there okay so they they are the scientists they believe that there are rational logical reasons to every single thing that is going on uh that like vampirism is a special type of like disease uh, and like that it's like a parasitic thing and that like werewolves are it's just like some mutation that's occurring they believe in trying to explain everything through science they call the supernatural monsters reality deviants and they kind of believe that the messengers are like these aliens now whether or not how specifically familiar with like the technocracy they really are 
kind of like up to whatever best suits the technocracy in the moment but like the, that's kind of where their research has led them and so okay their representative is jack curie he is an extraordinary citizen he has had an enlightened science is the technocracy term for magic and he has had some technocracy experiment used on him that has turned him permanently invisible so he, he is basically he he's the the invisible man here he's a uh you know chemist scientist type he works in gene facts laboratory a subsidiary of pentex pentex is like a super duper evil anti-nature anti-werewolf corporation fueled by the worm which is like just like one of those uh, just super evil entities, but people aren't really familiar with their existence. Okay, some of these guys, like side quest for one, they are able to perform a process called, or I guess they are able to implant uh, thaumatechnological prosthetics. They can surgically implant supernatural organs into mortals. So, you know, you can get like your... Uh, heart replaced with like a werewolf heart or something and you know it's both good and bad because now you can use some of those werewolf adrenaline rage powers but you'll also become you you might potentially like give in to rage or whatever this is one of those ideas from hunter the vigil i, I actually I, I quite like this idea i think it's pretty neat as like a various different kinds of ways that like uh, hunters can further modify and customize their characters okay so they have got a deviant from deviant the renegade a remade named lawrence brundle aka nine volt you know he, he's got some some mr roboto things going on he's like somewhere between human and machine he's got some like cybernetic stuff going on he's got like you know wires hanging out of every orifice of him and he, he needs to like eat batteries in order to survive and, and he kind of just wants like revenge on null mystery ease null mystery ease wants to like capture him and continue doing experiments on him you know maybe they're ultimately justified maybe it's necessary in order to continue the hunt against other supernaturals or maybe it's just like the insane mad scientist sort of uh experimentation of this jack curie guy and that like these guys are actually their own like just as bad as the other monsters type of thing going on uh, but the other thing that the null mystery ease has got going for them is that they've actually got like a plan they actually want to try to can collect enough evidence they want to collect enough like empirical data to actively be able to prove to the entire world at once the existence of the supernatural so they've actually unlike every other compacting group they, they've actually they've got like a goal in mind as to how they can see this whole situation ending and being fixed whether or not that would actually fix it uh you know who who knows it would definitely cause mass panic now, whether or not that mass panic ends with humans teaming up against vampires, or if that ends with just the destruction of the entire world, that's uh, hard to say. Okay, and the last group, uh, the Loyalist of Tula, aka the Indebted, or I guess I should say, technically their name is the Loyalist of Tula, but they're what they actually go by is the indebted okay so this is one of them we're breaching the subject of alternate history point um so in real life the society of tula they exist pretty much right before the nazis and they got this whole volkish movement going on convincing the german people that there is some like tie that binds them this like 
idea of like blood and soil that the German people are this one race that have been going on through since here and they have this conquest they're going to go on and over here um that is generally to say the society of tula straight up bad guys like you know straight up using like race science and stuff uh like 100 percent like all nazi fascist like really unmistakably bad guys in real life okay um in in world of darkness land um decades before the society of tula actually formed and existed in real life they were founded as a as a secret society of like occultist scholars and they originally wanted to try to find the origin of the supernatural they wanted to figure out where did werewolves come from where did vampires come from etc and then it wasn't until some number of decades later when they were quote unquote officially like founded and they got entirely co opted by the Nazis and then they their shift became focusing on finding the origins of civilization so they could continue to do their so they could find occultist, you know, Nazi esoteric reasons like the whole hyperborean thing to continue all their as both like this is like the spiritual excuse for their like race science and generally the loyalist of well not no no well the loyalists of tula are specifically the indebted they are the descendants of those original original creators and they are very upset about this whole ups like nazi situation that their society has turned into and uh, they in fact like go out of their way to try to like undo this damage and that's why they call themselves the indebted because they are now indebted to all of society for the like horrific you know atrocity that they accidentally well like i don't know about accidentally but like that they ended up being in some part like responsible for because they created this organization that ended up becoming a part of that whole ordeal but if we take for example how the society versus the loyalist would view something like vril and the power of the coming race right the society saw that as a book about utopia and as like a guide for the world they're supposed to be building building to like incubate and like move forward to like welcome the next master race and that the like white people are going to be become at some point that next great master race that like controls everything and they need to prepare society for that whereas the loyalist would have read it and interpreted it as like a warning and that like a master race is coming and is on the way but it's not going to be humans it's going to be these like vampires and that the loyalist of tula actually believe in like radical human equality because they like believe that all of humanity needs to work together to stop this threat of this next race of the vampires that is coming so okay quick little sidebar quick little tangent i did some research on the actual society of tula for this mostly because i was kind of just curious about their modern day iteration of if they are, are are they still around that kind of question entered my mind and of course unsurprisingly they are still well okay their organization doesn't exist but like esoteric nazism there is still so many people on the internet still talking about it and it's genuinely wild because there's like these three pillars going on at the same time on the one hand there's just the pure delusional craziness of believing in this conspiracy that is 
literally on the level of flat earth, this belief of the hollow earth and the city of Agartha and this ancient alien energy that exists. Uh, it's just, there. there's that aspect that is just truly wild and just insane. Then there's just the pure evil of like straight up like unadulterated, unfiltered, pure racism of just like literally just putting people into hierarchies and like assigning numbers to races like not even trying to be subtle not even dog whistle not even southern strategy just pure like hate and evil that's crazy and on the third side you have the whole internet memification of these angles and like i i learned so much slang doing this research and it's like it's crazy because they literally are combining like this old-timey like 1800s racism with new age internet meme speak and like like the entire time i was just like reading through all these different like forums and stuff i was just like uh, like my I, I could literally, I, I could feel the Disco Elysium skills in my mind. This is definitely satire. It is not. Um, like, it is just, like... I, like, I wish it was funny, like, I, or I wish I could find it funny, except for the fact that I know that that's intentional and they want that to be the case, so that people continue to look into it and like read the stuff and uh so unfortunately like racist just ruining everything again um all right but i digress back to the loyalists of tula aka the indebted all right so one of the potential sort of like internal conflicts going on here is kind of again sort of like the maiden's blood sisterhood thing going on that like at this point these guys are pretty much like the good guys like one of the few like they are doing good for the sake of good but again they are ineffective but these this time they are ineffective in a different way because they are so obsessed with specifically targeting supernaturals that were involved in some way in like the Shoah or in like Nazi culture or whatever to any extent that like you know these guys they might spend a full year researching and dedicating all their resources towards finding and hunting and killing a single like Nazi vampire but conceivably if they were if they were just like concerned with purely efficiency and just killing like vampires to save humans in general you know they they might have been more effective by like putting their they might have been able to find enough research to just kill any vampire within like a week and you know they might have been able to like hunt down 52 vampires in the time that it took them to find a single specific nazi vampire okay so there representative is rudolf eisner he is an antiquarian of the library company of philadelphia again very scholarly type can probably help the players with lore and all of that jazz um definitely a useful ally to have it's side quest so he is preparing here in philadelphia for the arrival of a tremere vampire Dieter Göring from Poland, uh, who is working on trying to expand the the Final Reich, which is basically this in-world group of vampire neo-Nazis who believe in vampire, like the master race is vampires, and that that's who they are going to, 
yeah you know that, that that's what they exist to like bring forth yeah, again if if the players if they've ever if they're getting a little too questionable into the whole are we the baddies you know if, if you need to uh, if if they need some sympathy built up if they just need to be good heroes again for a session to uh remind people that they're supposed to be the good guys you know just have them crash this uh neo-nazi gang and kill a neo-nazi vampire uh, or honestly the vampire might be old enough to just be a real bona fide actual nazi but yeah that that, that one's one of those pretty unmistakable like the, the party will be in the right um with that quest there's not really any sort of way that you're gonna reframe that one um okay and other thing he, he's a real they are the relic searchers these loyalists of tula they want to find all those ancient biblical ancient greek relics the one in particular that i recently just found out about its existence is the baghdad battery which was apparently like an ancient battery built in 200 something bc um with like copper and zinc or whatever um, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's been debunked. I'm pretty sure it's been declared a hoax. I, it just seems like such a strange, fascinating, like, relic to me. And I'm sure this, you know, we got our other battery guy, 9-Volt. They can have some connection. Maybe he needs this battery to be able to finally have the power to, like, take down this null mystery ease. Uh, so maybe you guys want to team up with the monsters on that one. Or maybe if you give it to Null Mystery Ease, they can use this battery to do some experiment to 9-volt to forward their science, whatever. I'm sure you could do stuff like that. Okay, so that was all the various groups of Philadelphia that your players could conceivably interact with. Next, I'm going to talk about the campaign goal. So again... If you have them start off by talking to like the Society of Leopold, who kind of has this idea of we need to get everyone to work together for the second coming of Christ, they, they can have like a sort of vision of like what their big picture is supposed to look like as to what they should be doing. Otherwise, Hunter the Reckoning has a real like connection that's pretty core to the whole idea of it to the time of judgment the end of times, the, oh god, what do they, not Golconda, Jesus Christ, what do they call it, Gehenna, the, uh, th th there is going to be an apocalypse happening. Before the campaign starts, I would pick out an apocalypse that you want to have happen at the end, um, uh, look up the book, Time of Judgment, find that somewhere, uh, they have tons and tons and tons of really awesome, interesting apocalypses. Some of them are unique to each of the different lines. Some of them are unique to specifically Hunter the Reckoning. Personally, I would pick like eight of them because they really, they can all work together at once. You, you can have a bunch of them happen at once. And then once you know which apocalypse slash apocalypses you want to have happen at the end, throughout the entire campaign, you can sprinkle in prophecies and setups for how this stuff is going to, which one is going to occur, right? So like one of the built-in sort of prophecies they have is the Apocrypha by Theodore the Hunter. And he, you know, there, there's stuff like the first sign will be the golden prince will be buried in his iron tomb with his retinue or something that I know was one of those one of them i have like a at least the theory of that being one of the the jfks that died in the plane or whatever but you could throw out all those prophecies and then like have like all these very esoteric things that like when these five things happen the end of times is upon us and then right once the players have that prophecy in their hands and they can kind of like read it and figure it out then all the like events of the campaign that they occur they can kind of try to figure out like how do these fit into the prophecies that we've heard about like is is this the first sign of theodore's like apocrypha and i feel like that really lends itself well to a campaign spanning sort of like 
that crazy sort of conspiratorial minded idea where they'll be having like you know all the pins on the board and the red yarn connecting them of how do all these line up like how do these fit in with the prophecy i i really love that idea okay so arc one the first couple of stories the first couple of sessions uh and by couple i mean i don't know maybe like three to five ish actually maybe, maybe even more maybe like somewhere between five and uh, i guess it depends how long you want the campaign to go but like eh, let's say like you know maybe a 24 session campaign uh maybe split each arc into about eight sessions give or take so arc one what i would try to accomplish by the end of that is introduce the compacts try to make sure that the players are familiar with all the other hunters hanging out here that they can potentially use as allies ideally over the course of this first arc they have made enough enemies and or they now owe enough people favors that the rest of the campaign will sort of or at least arc two will kind of just write itself as they have to try to navigate through all these enemies that they've created or whatever so the villain that i created for arc one of of the campaign is uh, Bimelech Toliadano La Sombra, Bishop of the Church of the Assumption. Uh, I know he's got his garden that he waters with vitae that have then become vampire plants. And, and like the whole sort of Arc 1 idea is that he has been feeding the locations of Camarilla vampires to the various hunters anonymously. And that they've been using this information to hunt down these vampires and then killing them. And and he's like doing this under like so allegedly like a like some faith-based hunter organization. And then towards the end of this first arc, you discover that this is actually a sabbat, a sword of cane. It is a vampire who has been doing all this feeding of information. And then he's kind of like the first uh sort of boss, if you will. Uh, okay, and then, yeah, at Arc 2, Act 2, you can kind of have just a continuation of whatever stuff they've built up over that first sort of arc just occur, or to just see all the consequences of that, try to tie up all the loose ends that were created in Act 1. And then the third act, that's when I would drop, boom, the time of judgment, the apocalypse, right? That's when the things get for realsies, uh, you know, Lucifer shows up, Jesus is showing up, the perfect Metis is born, uh, just Zvar, Zar Vago shows up with his airship army, uh, you know, just all, whatever craziness you want to have happen, happens, and, and then, you know, it's, it's about the players, like, navigating that, and now, now me, I, I really, I love a, campaign with escalation so i like the idea that like this arc one they are your normal neighborhood just joe schmo hunters and then by this last arc they are just uh you, you know they, they are in some way involved in this whole whether or not you know the technocracy needs some specific thing out of them or whatever right like the whole uh uh, like, like at this point they are in some way involved with the big movers and shakers and are really gonna be like is it saving the world that's that's really up to you when, <laughs> i guess at that point like a couple billion people have probably already died so you know i i, I think it's um I, you know I, I think if you're gonna have any world of darkness game and happily uh, with like people being the 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 good guys, I think you can get away with that in Hunter, uh, you know, especially with all the like lack of hope throughout the rest of it. I think you can get away with doing that. Okay, so session zero slash session one, it, depending on the circumstance, you might just want to have a real long session one where you handle a lot of stuff, or you might want to split this up. So. I would definitely play through everyone's imbuing. When I ran this campaign, I just had everyone 
get imbued all at the same time, which uh, I did it mostly out of like convenience so that I didn't really have to worry about how all the various, how they would come together and everything. Um, but I definitely think it, it was kind of lost, uh, like, like the significance and the importance of the imbuing. So I would definitely have everyone have their own individual imbuing. I would definitely like actively play through it and have people role play and do all that stuff, uh, especially because this should be like a pretty easy like intro to role playing if someone needs it, because already by their creed, they already know how they're going to act. They know whether or not, you know, their character is already created. So they're either going to defend these people or they're going to like attack these vampires or something. Or conceivably, I'm just thinking about this now, like, I guess you could do, like, have people create their characters except for their virtues and creeds and all that, play through their imbuing, and then have that determine their creed, which could be cool, but I would probably only do that with more, like, experienced players. But anyway, yeah, you just have people, right, especially because they're mostly, at this point, they're literally just human people, so it shouldn't be that hard for them to put themselves in the minds of these characters but yeah yeah so definitely play through the imbuings and then how do they meet definitely very important again if you have experienced players maybe you actively play through that whole line of them going from these joe schmo whoever's to the imbuing and then actively playing through what they do from their imbuing to connect with other people personally uh, I would probably just come up with ideas as to how all of them meet and then just sort of narrate that that happens and then just pick up with them having now to some degree knowing each other and like vaguely kind of getting a sense of what each other are already like uh, so that you don't have to like role play through the like, hi, I'm Joe and da 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 da. Uh, which can sometimes, especially with like newer players, can kind of be like that, a kind of awkward role play scene. But as for ways they can meet, maybe they meet on the hunter net, maybe they like use online research to see if other people have experienced stuff like this. Maybe they have the same quarry, maybe they like have both picked up on like a nearby like supernatural that they are both trying to hunt and then they like run into each other on that. Either way, for the first session, I definitely, I would have, I, I'd probably, you know, if you pick up with maybe like two, three weeks, maybe a month after they're imbuing as them getting together as a group, I would definitely run all of them going on their first like hunt uh, together. So this is just sort of my, well, and by my, I mean, uh, sort of stolen from a guy on Reddit whose account is now deleted. R.I.P. You were a good uh, hunter, DM, storyteller, ST. Uh, okay, so this is just a general sort of framework as to how a session might be structured. So, and again, it just follows a very classic, like, monster of the week type of formula. Step one, some sort of crime occurs. Someone might be kidnapped, um, someone might be murdered, someone might be, uh, maybe there's a robbery, maybe there is someone selling bad goods or bad drugs or, you know, the, the snuff films, a anything like that. There's some kind of crime that is uh, committed. And the police obviously have a mundane reason, a mundane excuse as to like how this of like who was responsible for this but like you guys okay i'm sorry so so then yeah hunter i i would start session what are people doing what is their their living home life routine like just do short scenes with everyone being humans you know interacting with their family or whatever or going to school doing their job whatever it is and and they like find out about this crime Maybe they, like, walk past it. Maybe they hear about it. Maybe they see it on the news, whatever it is. Uh, but And they can pick up on the fact that it is not mundane, that there is some supernatural element 
some like other thing beyond what uh, allegedly was responsible for this crime. Okay, so then they go out on the hunt. They know that like, hey, that murder wasn't a regular normal murder. There's no blood in the body or whatever. That is a vampire murder. So they go out and like try to hunt down that vampire. And this first time they fail. Maybe they go out and they just can't even find him. Maybe they go out. Maybe they think they killed him, but they actually killed a wrong monster. They killed a red herring. Or they go out and they find the monster and they fight him. And then the monster like wins and they have to like run away. Whatever. They 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 go out and they, they don't succeed. But they like learn something from this. They learn either a weakness from the monster. Maybe like a literal supernatural weakness. Or uh, they learn a way that they can exploit the monster. Maybe they know there's an opportunity that the monster is going to be here on this day or whatever. Or they find out where the monster lives. Or they find out something that the monster cares about. Or they find out um, someone else who is an enemy of this monster. And by they could either just find this out during the investigation. Or they could find this out like after they have failed or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, it's also important that the monster now knows about the hunters. The monster now knows that the hunters are after them, and he's going to prepare, and he's going to, like, plan. And maybe now he is going after the hunters, and he now knows that they have families, and he's going to start targeting their families. Or maybe he's just going to start targeting the hunters when they're by themselves. Um, so, like, the clock is, like, ticking at this point. Uh, well, I guess it is immediately as soon as the first crime happens because now you know like hey there's a monster out there killing people but you know now the clock is accelerating okay and now the players have to prepare they need to set up their trap they need to go to their allies and get the tools the they need to get the fire molotov cocktails built you know they, they have got to go to the city and get the records for the uh town hall basement or whatever and like find out all that uh you know they, they got to go to the sewers and figure out where they can pop in and out or whatever you know they, they got to do all their planning now and then the real hunt begins right now they've got their plan now they go forth and they enact their plan and they successfully kill that monster but uh what, what's important here is that there's no such thing as just winning in hunter the reckoning everything always comes at a cost or, or not necessarily okay well there, there's i uh, like it there's either you're going to experience winning on the outside but losing on the inside or you're gonna lose on the uh outside but win on the inside right you're either going to win at a cost right maybe you you successfully you hunt down that vampire and you kill him but in the process, you burn down the apartment and you burn down the neighbor's house and you killed his neighbor or whatever. And you killed an innocent person. And that's the cost of what you did. Um, or maybe you fight the vampire and he like rips your arm off or something. Or maybe you do kill the vampire and then you discover that that vampire was actually your daughter's girlfriend's best friend and that the... Uh, you know, somehow this comes back to you that you are somehow involved in their death and now your daughter hates you and you, like, you you succeed at killing the vampire but at the cost of this relationship that you care about, right? So, like, there's, there's something that will have, like, real future ramifications that you've, like, experienced at the cost of killing this monster. On the other side, maybe you can think that you've won, uh, that nothing happened, but there's actually some twist involved, right? You think that you defeated this vampire, but he was actually just uh, a schmuck for the vampire prince, who is the real person, like, responsible for the crime that happened. Um, you, you guys just killed, like, a patsy. Or that mages wanted you to find this vampire, and they wanted you to kill him the whole time so that they could, like, move in and then try to take over the city next, right? Like, you guys think you won... But you actually, like, didn't. What a twist. You know, hit him with the Shyamalan. 
All right, and then lastly, the 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 return home. Right, how has going on this hunt affected their home life? How are they coping with this? Like how how do they deal with the trauma that is having to be this monster hunter to like try your hardest to save the world like what do they do uh, and you know that that's where you have the whole human element and this is like super duper duper important to get right and ideally hopefully the win at a cost or the twist kind of can lead into the next session or you know you might just have to start over the process from the top that do be happening sometimes too. The other thing that's important is that this is just a general sort of vague guideline that I would try to keep in mind as you prepare your sessions. Uh, but you know, sometimes, right? Like the whole game, why would we be playing the RPG if there's not a chance for spontaneity to really just bring some real life back into this whole situation, right? Sometimes players they just go off they go out during that first hunt and just through some combination of sheer luck and or just uh like a just sheer creativity and imagination that you just couldn't have even prepared for sometimes they'll just like run out and they'll just kill the monster on the first try and like uh you know you you just you gotta let that happen you gotta work with it and roll with it when stuff like that happens uh, or sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes you really expect that they're going to succeed and kill this monster, and then they end up losing. And again, th those those spicy bits, that's really what you play the game for, when things don't go the way that you expect them to. Um, so obviously, do not try to force any session into this. Just to like keep it as like a thing that you might want to build the session around. But yeah, be, be prepared to throw it out when, when it doesn't work out. Okay, so here I just got a long old list of various hooks that could conceivably be used for various sessions as things that, you know, hunters could try to hunt down. Okay, Mezin Kalakan, a Garal, a werebear of the Garu, elder shapeshifter, hundreds of years old, a member of the Lenape tribe. He's in a deep slumber in his cairn underneath Fairmount Park. Um, and there is now a proposed construction or, of a parking lot uh, going to be over his resting place. So a couple of directions you could potentially take this. Maybe the players need to stop this, stop this parking lot from being constructed so that this guy's slumber isn't, you know, messed up. You know, so maybe they have to work with some environmentalists or some activists and you know may, maybe those guys end up being their own bad kind of supernatural or maybe they just try to hunt this thing down before the construction lot is created uh may, maybe like they've got connections one of these people is like friends with the mayor's brother or whatever and it is vitally important to the election that like this uh zoning law for this parking lot gets created or something right yeah, like i would definitely try to uh work this one into like real world politics to some extent um and or more importantly specifically with what the players have going on but i will say generally giant werebear uh you're going to need like an elder garu shapeshifter you're going to need some serious firepower if you want it to work to have a chance at killing this guy this would be a like one of those unfortunate like hey we got to work with the ashwood abbey on this one uh this would be one of them type of situations like any kind of just you know regular hunter party is uh not gonna have what it takes to fight this kind of a beast okay uh next hook this one's vaguely sort of connected gabriel barker the last wolf of fairmount of the silver fang tribe uh, his, he's gone insane, and he's just now openly attacking park goers, right? He is committing the mega sin of eating people. Um, so his father, Sir Daniel Barker, coming down from uh, Sprell State Forest to put him down. Now, maybe you guys have to decide to work with this old 
a werewolf to kill this young werewolf. Maybe you decide both of these werewolves have to die. Um, that, that's up to the party. And then, little extra spice being added on here, Gabriel Barker has a girlfriend who is pregnant. Uh, and, you know, so do your players, do you take the risk that she might give birth to a a kin, whatever, kin spirit, kin folk, whatever they call them, that might become a Garu? Uh, or Sydney Morrison, maybe she is a Garu too. And maybe this is one of those illegal, forbidden Metis loves. Um, or maybe this could be the birth of the perfect Metis and is the first sign or one of the signs of the coming end times. Okay, another hook. All right, this one. Uh, all right, those, those, these first two ones are pretty good solid hooks that you could write a whole session about. The last, the next whole line of hooks, all the rest of these are not actually hooks. They are just half-baked ideas as for potential sort of like encounters that uh, these could conceivably have sessions written about them, but they would need a lot of work done to really flesh them out. Okay, so I'm just going to start, like, rapid-firing these. Gangrel Anarchs. They are working with activists to free animals from the Philadelphia Zoo. Maybe Maiden's Blood, maybe Melissa is accidentally working with vampires and she doesn't even know it. Okay. All right, actually, and by we're going to fire rapid-fire, I meant where this next one's going to take a while. Okay, Zombie. Shi Mei in Chinatown. They are a new Kui Jin. Kui Jin. Oof. And then what a subject. Personally, I really love them. I think they are insanely super cool. That being said, they like undeniably have two issues. Uh, number one, the sort of what I'm going to call accidental racism, because I really don't think that this part was intended at all, and I think it was just a natural consequence of building this mega world and just constantly tacking on new stuff and constantly adding new cultures and how they work onto this world. And so I, I think this is just like a sort of natural consequence of the super bloated, sprawling meta plot that I love, but there's problems with it, uh, is that is these like natural contradictions that uh, kind of accidentally presupposes that like Asian people's souls works differently than white people's souls in the sense that only Asian people are capable of having their soul being re-risen as one of these Kui Jin because apparently the hells I guess are segregated and you go to various hells based on your ethnicity I guess um I don't know how else that's really happening which is just like that's got to be one of the I know that one was just purely out of like like just ignorance and like I know that one was definitely like unintentional and like an accident but uh definitely still kind of like like undeniably kind of racist um but kind of funny the other one is a little less funny uh and that's the like rampant like orientalism uh throughout the entirety of kindred of the east in the sense that they really had no second thoughts about pulling, we're going to take this idea from Shinto and combine it with this idea from Buddhism and just like homogenizing and combining all of all like East Asian uh, culture and religion and everything to work for all of those areas. Um, which again, I think that's kind of like a consequence of like what really should have been like its own line uh ended up being a single splat book that ended up covering every single type of supernatural and like like covering just way 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 too much and then the writers just like picking and choosing ideas from various asian cultures based on whether or not it was convenient or if it was cool um and to be fair to them they succeeded in the sense that it is really, really cool. There are lots of really awesome ideas going on in Kindred of the East. The The parts where they take stuff because it's convenient, though, just because it's like, oh, this idea is kind of like this idea. Let's just say they work the same way. That was a little bit of a problem. That being said, my, my overall take, I think Equation, super cool idea, definitely worth salvaging. Uh, I don't think 
not all of their ideas can just be used right out of the book, though. Some of those need a little bit of uh, polishing to <laughs> before I, I would uh, do anything with them again. Okay, but basically, the, anyway, the equation, they are reverse vampires in the sense that when they come out, they when they are first reborn or whatever their term rebreathed breathed life into i think is what their embrace is called they like are crazy animalistic um and they, they just are savage and just like run around eating people's flesh or whatever and and but over time they are able to become more and more enlightened and more and more they are able to then get chi out of drinking blood and then they can get chi out of other people's breath and then they can just get chi out of being near people so so they yeah so whereas vampires the older and older they get they just become more evil and more animalistic the opposite happens to the kui jin which i think is like an interesting sort of conundrum for hunters right because obviously right now this guy's a problem. Right now this guy is running around eating people's flesh. And you can't be having that happen. But if you let him survive, potentially he might even come to your side eventually. Like he might be able to eventually become an elder who like masters his sort of skill. And like is with you guys against the vampires and is actively not even hurting anyone. So I, I really love a specifically how the equation sort of interact as like Hunter the Reckoning monsters. Okay, zombies at Parks Casino. So zombie zombies, as in the Walking Dead, Shamblers, Hunter the Reckoning, are sort of supposed to be the core default enemy, but I really kind of don't like them as an enemy for a great variety of reasons. On the one hand, they're just not, like, interesting, like vampires are. Like, on the one hand, they just straight up, they don't have the whole human element. They are brainless. On the other hand, there's not really much of a hunt aspect. You don't need to try to track them down and figure out where they are and what their weaknesses are. Right? Zombies, you just walk up to them and you shoot them in the head with your shotgun. And also... Like, I feel like they make a lot less sense masquerade-wise. Like, a single vampire, sure, can be explained as, like, a spree killer or whatever. But when you have, like, a horde of 20 dudes, like, running around killing people and eating people, like, how are regular people rationalizing that? Like, maybe bath salts? Maybe uh like I, I you could this one seems like a cheap shot but you could probably do some kensington fentanyl trank something or other with that but otherwise like i just feel like the the zombies just they seem very like antithetical to all the things that make hunter the reckoning interesting uh like as an enemy uh but anyway as parks casino well okay now actually no, 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 i got even more okay so there's also, with how they connect to the rest of the lore, now obviously Hunter the Reckoning is so mysterious and anything can work anyway because of, uh, you know, no, no one knows the answers to anything, uh, which, fair enough. But, like on the one hand, they're either like Giovanni, necromancer, mindless slaves, like servants, and at which point they are just like mindless drones, which on the one hand, why would they be out and about they're probably just hanging out at the giovanni mansion being butlers or whatever um or they're like following the giovanni and like protecting them they wouldn't just be like roaming the streets for no reason waiting for hunters to kill them or on the other hand they are like wraith risen in which case like they why are they in hordes why would they be like eating people's brains like those the risen are like people with you know specific things they have actual they are like sentient and they have like unfinished business on the earth that they are trying to complete and and so like the shamblers of like of like the hunter of the reckoning enemy bestiary or whatever i just i don't even see where they're supposed to like fit in with any other with anything else going on in the setting but anyway, if someone could tell me how zombies are actually supposed to work, I, I do like the idea of these of these walkers, these shamblers, 
as being like a people old people at parks casino just uh you know because they have a lot of the same traits as like the shamblers and that they are just monotonously repeating doing the same thing just sitting there at the slot machine um and and you could get close to them and they would smell really bad uh and i feel like to regular people this would not right you know this wouldn't trigger their like delirium or whatever or like they they could very easily rationalize these types as zombies i don't know how to make this one work but uh someone do the work and make that one for me okay the abandoned logan theater uh nosferatu phantom of the opera you know since since we're putting all the classic universal horror monster movies in here through one way or another uh you know you, you gotta throw in the phantom of the opera okay sabat shovelhead brings us slash slash slachta 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 to a dog fighting ring uh you know i just think that that won't be a little fun you could have good old fight against you know vampire street gang versus mortal street gang uh, i think that could be a good little encounter the shatters an incestuous cabal of witches native to fishtown honestly this one i just love so much <laughs> the writers of like hunter just threw some real shade onto fishtown but <laughs> Because, of course, the incestuous clan of witches would be hanging out there. Shatters, also, apparently, Shad is the fish that is fished in Fishtown. That, that was something I learned. I just, I, I love that <laughs> that's a thing that exists. Um, definitely, you gotta include that one. Um, okay, the Ghost Finder League. This is your, your, your ghost hunters with Scott, whatever his name is. Uh, I don't even remember if that's actually him. But I, I love the, like, these guys have zero connection to the supernatural. Uh, they've got zero, like, real evidence that ghosts are real. Um, but, but they believe in them anyways, and they are, like, going to haunted mansions or whatever. Ooh, actually, I didn't even think about this. We could do the uh, Penn State uh, Penitentiary, or, oh god, is that the name of it? the uh, Penn State Penitentiary Penitentiary Eastern State that's what I meant <laughs> the Eastern State Penitentiary uh, you could definitely do something with them going inside there you know what? I actually gotta take that uh, pop that in there boom um, but basically they go out and they try to find ghosts and they just exist to just get into trouble and you have to like go forward and save them. Uh, this also this was a Vampire the Masquerade Bloodline quest too. Uh, one of the more fun quests. Uh, you you honestly could just rip that one straight out where there's a she a Hecate Hecata, which I forget. She's one of the the vampires that eats flesh though. I, I, no, that's not Hecata. Which of the vampires is the flesh eaters? I forget. But you know the the you you could do that. I, th I think that would be a fun fun little side quest okay Alphonse the Promethean uh so the Prometheans I as a monster or whatever or as like a characters to play I think they're cool but ultimately eh whatever but I think as like a hunter villain I think they are brilliant okay so the Prometheans they have the Prometheans are Frankensteins they create disquiet and I actually, I love this idea of how they created this, how you could be a Frankenstein in the world of darkness. And that is the sense of like, like how could you be a Frankenstein while still being able to role play and interact with humans? And basically, if you're playing a Frankenstein, you generate this thing called uh, disquiet. And so basically, the longer you spend near people just the more they supernaturally hate you. Uh, and if you spend like, like if you just spend a lot of time near the same people, then they are just going to form a mob and kill you. Um, so the Prometheans, the created, they are constantly on the move. Um, but generally they are very sympathetic. So the Promethe Prometheans, they are they are not human, they are created life, and all humans can sense that, that they are unnatural, and so they naturally just hate them. 
uh, because because they should not exist. But the Promethean, generally, they are pretty cool, nice guys. They genuinely, their goal is to become human. And unlike vampires who will never actually become human, uh, Prometheans actually can. They just, they need to spend a lot of time near humanity. They need to try to understand humanity. They need to try to replicate humanity. They need to try to help humanity. Um, so, so they genuinely are like one of the few good supernaturals. Uh, but again, they're, they're just the kind of this natural sort of like tragedy to them. Because like, if you guys are hunters and you come across Alphonse the Promethean, he might be like, hey, look, like this vampire is like killing innocent people. Like, I want to help you guys. Like, I want to help you guys kill this vampire to help humanity. Um, but again, if you guys spend too much time with him, he can't stay here forever. Because he, you guys will just, you guys aren't immune to like hating him. Like you, you guys will like just want to kill him after a while. Which, if anything, makes the Prometheans the easiest supernaturals in the world to hunt. They are just like they are literally built to like turn normal people into hunters. Which this is this is kind of like an idea that goes off of. The book that shall not be named. Um, and by that, I mean Beast, where uh, Beast did the same thing, where they turned people around them hunters, uh, except, well, they were called heroes, and heroes are just, like, terrible, terrible people for reasons. They are just, like, hyper-narcissists. Uh, so you guys as Beast are supposed to, like, not feel bad for, like, killing them. It was just... Well, what a book that one was. Okay. So yeah, so Prometheans, I, I, I love as like hunter, and not even antagonists, just like NPCs. Uh, but the other thing is that they are sources of alchemy. Um, so like they just, in order to live, they have to generate this fuel that is super duper duper helpful for mages. You can like straight up become like immortal off of this stuff, which if you guys wanted to like get a lot done hunting wise you guys could like capture one of these guys bring them down to you know the loyalists of tula or whatever and or actually more likely the uh null mystery ease and you know harvest this guy and like use all his alchemy to kill a hundred vampires or something um so yeah just just lots of interesting things going on with the prometheans big fan okay mummy cult that reincarnates through the bodies of the cultist. I like that idea of just like the hunters, the group of hunters just like killing the same guy over and over, but he just, you know, he's using a different body every time, so it just looks wildly different. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what to do with that one, but I think that one would be a lot of fun. Okay, Grumblethorpe uh, in Germantown. I like the idea of a revolutionary soldier ghost. Don't really know what to do with that wraith, but, you know, feels very... Old Town, Philadelphia, E. You, you gotta have some of those throwbacks to the whole Revolutionary War, because that's, that's pretty important to that city, I hear. Okay, the Muter Museum. Uh, the Y-Star Brain Collection, which is apparently just, like, brains of a bunch of poets and allegedly smart people. Just a, a fun little Philadelphia oddity. Uh, this is wanted by an earthbound malefactor, an Anunnaki, and is some connection to Dagon teaming up with the technocracy and wanting to remove all identity from all humans and make them all one giant machine of pure efficiency. Okay, the slasher Samuel Arcady is an ex-hunter with a archangel complex. He's gotten too into the hunt. This is one of those warnings of what happens when you become when you lose your human side and you get 100% into just killing people, you know, and they, you, you start going insane and you start killing people who actually aren't even involved in the supernatural, but you like, you, you like lose any sense of being able to tell, uh, like, like your, your vision just starts, your second sight starts going like, uh, just wild and it starts, you know, betraying you basically. So so it's possible to be 
uh, you know, th this guy, just a good little warning sign. This guy was my session one when I did uh, my version of the campaign because I based it off of the intro to the Hunter the Reckoning video game. Where there's a very similar same thing going on. But yeah, just warning to the players what happens when you get too into the hunt that uh, you know you, you become the monster. But he otherwise, he's got like a lot of useful information. He, he's got a lot of stuff going on with all his various targets and how he planned on attacking these different monsters. Okay, an unseely marrow in the Schuylkill River. You know, you got to get that beast of the Black Lagoon or whatever. Throw, throw in that universal monster too. Okay, the Unchained. All right, so as opposed to the old school Demon the Fallen, the new age Demon the Fallen. Now this one's probably the most out there of any of these quests. The the Armageddians, this of these cultists of this cult compound that each have given a little bit of their memory, a little bit of their life to Unchained to create a perfect cover for him. The Unchained are almost like these somewhere between Demon the Fallen and somewhere between like Matrix uh guys. They come from a future, well, in, in my version, this specific setting, they are coming from a future where the God Machine has replaced Essential Divinity, the, the, the capital G God. Like the technocracy has enacted some plan that where they succeeded in creating that. And then this Unchained is on a, he, he's come back to this timeline. He's come back in time in order to stop that from happening. But, you know, he's got a whole Waco thing going on with the ATF attacking him or whatever. So maybe you team up with him against the technocracy. Maybe you team up with the technocracy against him. Uh, whatever you want to do with that. Okay, another one. All right, specific to the compacts. Uh, Melissa has a vision of the Ashwood Abbey, you know, burning her as a witch. And, you know, assuming that the players are more friends with her than they are with the Ashwood Abbey. She asks the PCs to preemptively strike against them, which, you know, a little bit of that minority report problem. Like, are you guys willing to attack fellow hunters? A little bit of a moral quandary there for you. Okay. So themes that you really want to make sure you touch on in Hunter the Reckoning in your campaign. And by this, I mean specifically feelings that you want to evoke, things that your players should always, to some degree, be struggling with. Uh, number one, accountability. This one's pretty pretty core to the whole experience in the game, right? Every single night that you go out and you hunt, that is a night that you are not spending at home. That is a dance recital of your daughter that you are missing and that's a little bit of like you know, you know the are just like you're you, a little bit of losing that idea of what you are doing all this fighting for all this humanity you care about right like everything in hunter there's never a right choice because every single night that you spend at home with your family right that is a night that you know, there, there's a monster, there's a vampire running around in a, murdering an innocent person, you know? So so there's always guilt, and there's always shame. You, you, you are directly responsible for, like, what is happening. Like, you, you are always directly responsible for, like, the bad things happening in your life. You are constantly accountable for everything that happens. Every time an innocent gets hurt because of your actions, right? That, that is your cross to bear. You have to somehow cope with that. The other idea is paranoia. The hunters really never know what is going on. First of all, now they know there are monsters going about. So the one thing they do know for certain is that they are never, ever, ever safe. Any vampire can fly through your window at any time and just suck your blood, right? Or a werewolf can, you know, see you walking down the park and just rip you in half or whatever you're just never ever safe and you never really know what's happening you never like you don't even know if these messengers if they are good guys you have no idea what they want you have 
no idea if you can even really trust your fellow hunters. You don't even really know if they're doing what they're doing for the right reasons. You just have to have doubt in everything all the time. And, and yeah, on just like the littlest things to the biggest things. Um, this just like seeps into every single factor, every single facet of your life. Now more talking about a little bit of the system itself. Okay, so the personality thing in in all the old school White Wolf games has been, or I don't know, old school, but in that Hunter the Reckoning generation era of White School or White Wolf games is this personality way, like the way you write down your character's personality, as opposed to like D and D's person, you know, personality bonds, flaws, whatever. This, you have your nature and your demeanor. And personally, I never really liked nature and demeanor. It's my understanding of it was that like, okay, so your nature is who you really are, but the demeanor is you the show you put on for the world, which I guess kind of just naturally implies everyone in the world of darkness is like duplicitous, which I guess like, sure, that makes sense, I guess, but like, who are you hiding your nature from? Like, I guess it, it can be used against you, maybe. Uh, but, like, since you otherwise just have your demeanor up all the time, and that's what you show to the world, like, how is it a problem if someone knows your nature? Because you can just act is within your demeanor. So, like, what is even... How is this supposed to work? What is the point of this? Why even bother with the demeanor? Why can't I just be who I am? Like... How am I not just my nature? Like, this doesn't make sense to me. Then I understood it. Uh, someone explained it to me as such. Okay, your demeanor is who you are unless it would ever get in the way of your nature. And as soon as I heard it explained like that, I was like, oh my god. That was like the biggest like light bulb moment I've had for like a year. Like, that is just... It is so, uh, yeah, because I instantly went from like hating nature and demeanor and thinking that it was like dumb to now thinking that nature and demeanor is like possibly my favorite way to instantly give anyone a real nuanced, complicated character. I, I now like love the idea of nature and demeanor. And I think I honestly, I might take this into other role playing games that I play. Um, cause I love how it just like instantly leads to like internal conflict that like, you know, on the outside you are, you know, you're the conformist or whatever, and you just go along with whatever is like easiest and whatever everyone else is doing, but your nature is an anarchist. And as soon as like, a, a hierarchy becomes involved and someone claims that they are in charge or something that's when you like be, have a problem and that's when you like speak up and whatever or or you know maybe the reverse maybe on the outside you your demeanor is like an anarchist right and like just all the time you're always you know talking the good talk about how much you don't believe in these hierarchies or whatever but then as soon as like push comes to shove and like you either got to like get into the group or get kicked out of the group, you are just a conformist and you just hop in. And I was like, all, all that talk was just uh, nothing. So I, I love that, that internal conflict generator from the nature and demeanor. Now that I actually understand how it's supposed to work. And now it really feels justified when you regain your, willpower by acting within your nature because you're not normally supposed to act within your nature you're normally otherwise always just acting within your demeanor because that's who you are and your nature is just who you're willing to like the only aspect that you're willing to get into uh, an internal conflict over so so i i love that idea now uh, okay another system uh within hunter the reckoning the conviction gambling so I love it from a thematic perspective of this idea of the more you believe in yourself, you gamble your conviction, you get bonuses on rolls, and then you get conviction and you gain conviction. And the more you believe in yourself, 
the more you can do this and the more that you succeed. Uh, and then the reverse happens, right? Like when you stop believing in yourself, you lose your conviction and you stop succeeding stuff and you like get like, you know, there, there's just like a feedback loop that either works for you or it's a feedback loop that works against you, which does seem very much so in line with how faith as an idea kind of functions. Uh, so I really like it from that perspective. But from a gameplay perspective, it feels very weird because now you like spend your conviction on like easy roles to like just gain more conviction uh, and like you're always trying to figure out how to use a conviction at least once per scene like you're always trying to figure out how to use your edges or whatever and make them relevant which really, I don't think that should be incentivized to feel like, you know, you should use your edges to use your edge, not to use your edge in order to try to gain conviction. Because um, it, it feels like it sort of incentivizes a sort of gamey play style, right? If, uh, which, you know, and then they just throw the whole like DM fiat sort of like, and remember, you must, like, as the storyteller, it is your responsibility. Just, you know, tell them when they can use their conviction and when they can't use their conviction. And it's just like, I <sighs> like, I I dislike having to put all of that on the on the DM, right? I would rather that like conviction just be a thing that you use when you are in desperate need of faith. Which on the one hand, right, would it not just sort of work like? willpower then right if it's just like a thing that you spend and you like regain and on the other hand like well what's the difference between willpower and conviction well i would say like willpower is your like personal strength right since it's tied to your nature and like fulfilling your nature fulfilling your identity and being like validated in your identity by your ability to succeed in being the person who you are right Whereas like your conviction you gain in succeeding in your sort of like quest and like succeeding in during the hunt and using your edges on the hunt and whatever. And like uh, your conviction is like your belief in the whole like like your whole mission as a as someone trying to kill these supernatural guys. Um yeah, but I, I just, I generally kind of dislike the gambling aspect. Like, it's just, I want it to work, but I really, I don't know how you can do it in such a way that it, like, I don't know, really, like, just works without having to rely on the DM saying when you can use conviction and when you can't. Yeah, I, I think ideally it, it would probably just work better as simply just a resource kind of like willpower but in that question how do you regain it then well okay uh so there's this idea in the new world of darkness games the touch stones now i know generally people dislike I, i've heard a lot of hate for hunter the reckoning v5 which i can see where people are coming from just because i think it's not that it's like a bad RPG in and of itself, but it's just kind of a lamer version of both Hunter the Vigil and a lamer version of Hunter the Reckoning. Like, it's just those games with stuff taken out. Just like, well, what, what's, like, what, what are we doing here? But they did create these ideas called touchstones, which again, there's another thing. I've seen lots of people really hating on these on this idea Honestly, I kind of like the idea of the touchstones. And this is basically in D&D would be your bond. It's this is the thing that literally ties you to human society. Like this is your thing that you are fighting for. Um this is why you think it is all worth it. And then like interacting with your touchstone is what causes you to regain your conviction. Or at least that's how it would work in this version of Under the Reckoning. So, you know, your, your touchstone might be your family, your wife. Maybe it's, like, your job, or maybe it's, like, going to school or something. Uh, but it's something that is actively, like, th 
threatened by this this the hunt right it's something that like could be ruined if you let supernaturals survive and then if you ever lose it right then you know that that is your source of conviction gone basically and so i guess it should in some way be possible to get new touchstones like you know it, it shouldn't just be as easy as like uh oh lost my touchstone need to find a new wife let's go to vegas really quick or whatever but uh like i guess what i would do is i would probably uh, like put like a two session minimum on losing your touchstone like if your wife dies or whatever because on the one hand you know i guess it would suck to play the game without being able to use your hunter superpowers but on the other hand there, there has to be like a a downside like a a penalty for losing your your touchstone okay so that's basically all my thoughts regarding this hunter the reckoning sort of way you can run it or whatever there's just a lot of my thoughts on it in general but i wanted to end on just a little dream on a little just like because i i i love the idea i just have since I've played Hunter the Reckoning for the first time, I I wish there was like a good Hunter the Reckoning RPG. And so in my mind, if I had infinite resources and could make my dream video game, like this is what it would be. Like taking from Disco Elysium, right, the, for one, the, most of Hunter the Reckoning is like detective y stuff. Like you're you gotta figure out which type of supernatural was responsible for this, and then you have to find them. Um, but specifically more so the internal dialogue that you have when you like talk to your skills. I love the idea of like talking to your virtues and then you know your mercy, your redemption, arguing with your like Avenger or whatever. I think that could be very fun and then having the things that you do in game affect how much of each virtue you have and how much they talk to you. Uh, I think it could be awesome. Okay. From new Vegas, the idea of all the various factions and how they interact and like navigating between them and through all of them, uh, I think could be very, very cool. Uh, you know, I love, love that from new Vegas, um, from bloodlines, VTM, just the vibe, honestly, all, how the characters are just so incredibly characterful and how like the side quests are just so crazy and so awesome and so memorable and all those little moments in bloodlines that just uh like that i'll never forget like the stop sign and all that uh ju but just that the vibe of that game and lastly kind of from papers please this idea that you have to balance your work with your life right like in papers please you need to keep this job to feed your family and at some points stuff will happen where like your son needs medication but you can't afford it off of your salary and if you want to be able to afford it you're gonna have to like accept a bribe from someone and like let them into the country and then live with the consequences of what that might mean for your country and also the potential of like losing your job but I, yeah i love that sort of idea i think that would be really crucial to like a proper hunter game of like always sometimes having to sacrifice the hunt in order to keep your family all right and with that i'm gonna go goodbye oh god jesus no